morning. Good to see everyone. Hey there. All right, can anyone see what I have here? You might have to come a little closer. What do I got here? Yeah. Yeah, this is a ball of clay. And what, uh, well, tell me a little about it. What do you, what, do you, what does it look like? What do you see? Yeah, Wesley. A yeah, it kind of looks like a pancake. Yeah. Sort of just a little smush, yeah. What else do we see here? Yeah. Yeah, so one side is very flat and the other side is very bumpy. What else do you see here? It kind of looks like a frowny face the way that I smushed it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this could be made into something else. So, what, I mean, what's something that we, we could make out of this? Yeah, Penny. You could make a house, Wesley. You could make another pancake, absolutely. Yeah, you could make something, you know, it looked like food, water. Yeah, you could make this look like the whole world, right? If you kind of rolled it up into a nice sphere, yeah? Make it look like a hot dog. You could make it look like a hot dog. You could make this look like just about anything, right? Now, in the beginning, the very first story in the Bible is about the creation of the world. And right at the beginning, the very first sentence in the Bible, it says that the world was formless. Does anyone know what that word means? Formless? Yeah? No one knows what form it is? Yeah, no one knows what form it is. Formless. It means it doesn't really have a shape. It really doesn't look like much of anything, which is sort of how I would describe this ball of clay here. It's, it's formless. I mean, it looks like a pancake. It might look like a frowny face, but really it's just kind of a lump, right? And just like what you all did, when God looked at the formless world, God didn't just see a blob. God saw all the things that God could make out of that little ball of clay. And God started creating things like the sun and the moon and the stars and plants and animals and rivers. And God also made each of you. And God is still creating us and creating things in the world today. So anytime you look around the world or you feel like maybe something in your life is a little formless, is kind of just like a lump of clay, remember that when God sees something like that, God sees all the things that God could make and all the new things that could happen. Let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you took hold of the formless earth and made all that is. And we thank you especially for creating each one of us, each of these children made in your image, formed to bring your light and your love into our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, and you can all go to class. In the beginning, while God was creating, the world was formless and void, welter and waste. And the Spirit of God hovered over the swirling chaos, the breath of God brooded over the deep. The wind blew over the water. Even the most basic understanding of how the world was formed will tell you just how true that is. that all that is on earth today was born out of chaos. We know that when the earth was formed, it was 
bombarded by asteroids. We know that as life grew, it mutated in murky pools. We know that since that day, mountains have formed and been washed away. Species have come and gone. Continents have drifted apart. Stars have been born and died. Of course, our ancestors could not have known all that. But it didn't stop them from telling the truth about where we come from. All that is and all that will ever be is a mixture of two basic ingredients, chaos and the spirit of God. In the beginning, when God was creating, the world was formless and void and the Spirit of God hovered over the dark, swirling waters. That is, all that is and all that will be emerged from chaos with the guidance of God's Spirit that hovered over the waters. The first chapter of Genesis, and indeed the very Bible, begins with this sentence about the spirit hovering over a world that is a formless void. The words in Hebrew, tohu abohu. They are words that resist translation. And so if you read this story in different translations of the Bible, it sounds almost completely different. Tohu abohu, formless void, welter and waste. Many people have tried to create and capture the sense of these words, barren, vacant, uncreated. These words actually almost scarcely show up in the Bible ever again as if they're so tied up with the mystery of these first moments that they were, the words themselves couldn't bear any more weight. Tohu avohu, formless and void. But there's something missing from all the English translations that we've relied on because scholars tell us that the words also have this sense that there's something happening. There's a barrenness that is humming with potential, almost a, a vibration or, a, or it escapes language. My favorite translation is written by a woman named Aviva Zornberg, who is trained as a biblical scholar and also a poet. So she's uniquely qualified. She calls it the murmuring deep, the spirit hovering over the murmuring deep. What does that image from scripture look like in your mind's eye? I always imagined it as a sort of a fr like a frothy ocean and then a couple summers ago, I was in Yellowstone National Park and I saw the bubbling mud pits and that has become my new image. Maybe even a heavily used painter's palette with all the colors swirled together and clumping. Sometimes I imagine it as a sound, the sound of the orchestra before the conductor comes on stage. That din of noise full of anticipation. The murmuring deep. It's chaos to be sure, formless and without order. But it's not nothing. There's potential there. There's something waiting to be made. There is beauty yet waiting forth to spring from the muddle. And so then God comes along to make something. But not to make something out of nothing, 
to make something out of the murmuring deep, to give form to the formless, to bring music out of the noise. And that's how our sacred story begins. And of course, this doesn't only happen on the grand cosmic scale. The Pentecost story that we heard last week is another moment in history when God's spirit emerged in the midst of chaos so that something new could be made. And so it is in this season of Pentecost that we celebrate how God's spirit awakens us to do something new, to hear each other in new ways and to love each other more deeply. In this season of Pentecost, in this beginning of the church year, we rejoice that God is not content to let us know only our old way, but sets new paths before us. And that transformation, whether it's in our lives or in the church or in our community or the world, it all starts just like the creation story, with God's spirit descending into a turbulent place to make the chaos creative, to make the turmoil generative. Now, most of you, if you're like me, have time and time again in your life called out to God in the midst of a turbulent time, in the midst of a moment when everything felt like it was tossed up in the air. We turn to God in chaos when things are in disarray. And if you're like me, your prayer is this, God, make it stop. Quiet the noise, calm the stormy, See, And many of you know that God indeed does lead us beside still waters. God makes us lie down in green pastures. God brings us rest and peace. But that's not the only thing that God does. Sometimes when God comes to us in the midst of chaos, it's not to quiet the storm, but to make something new. And not just to make any new thing, but to make something good. That refrain of the creation story, God made it, God saw it, and it was good. Everything that comes out of that creative moment, before it is even named, God calls it good. Before the apple tree or the aardvark or the clownfish had their names, they were known simply as good, God's good creations. And before you or I had our names, we were simply called good, good creations of God. So when the Spirit comes into the middle of chaos, it is to make something new and to make something good. And not just back then, but now. The story of where we came from, like most origin stories. It tells us something about who we are now. It tells us something about who God is here, today. And this is what I think it tells us. It tells us that whenever there's a little chaos and a little bit of the spirit, God's voice echoes out and says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you see it? The good news is that God is creating something new, and it's going to be good. The bad news is that the recipe calls for chaos. Maybe that's why Jesus said things like, whoever wants to save their life needs to lose it. Maybe it's why when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, he looked around and he said, not one stone will be left on another. 
everyone will be thrown down. But let's be honest. We don't need ruined cities to convince us that the world is full of chaos. And we don't need to fear for our lives to feel the murmuring deep in our own hearts. That chaos from the world's first day is around us still and within us even now, like the disarray of an orchestra whose conductor is late to the show like a storm on the ocean with no sign of letting up. Life feels like that sometimes. The world feels like that sometimes. In the beginning, God was creating something good out of chaos. And it hasn't stopped yet. It didn't stop with microbes in swampy lakes. It continues with you and I wondering how we will survive the deepest challenges of our lives. It's all part of that same murmuring deep. The chaos bristling with energy, yearning to be made new. And the Spirit of God is hovering over the chaos looking to make something new, looking to make something good. And you and I simply live in a world that is not fully formed. We live in a world that is not fully formed. And we need to learn what it takes to live in a world that is not fully formed. We need to learn how to be hospitable with each other, knowing that each one of us is a work in progress, because that murmuring chaos is around us even still. It's a British novelist, Mary Ann Evans, who wrote under the name George Eliot. She said this, if we had a keen vision and a feeling for all ordinary human life, if, if we had a keen vision and a feeling for all ordinary human life, it would be like listening to the grass grow or hearing a squirrel's heartbeat and we might die from the roar that lies on the other side of silence the roar on the other side of silence, the murmuring deep. Evans went on to say that most of us cannot bear to listen so deeply to the cacophony of chaotic little noises that underlie everything, so we tend to just walk around all wadded up instead. but I want to try to learn to listen. I want to see if I can hear that swirling chaos that's still lingering for the first day because if we could get in touch with that chaos, we might also meet the Spirit of God who is hovering over it all, waiting to make something good something very, very good. <laughs>